So let's proceed to the third and final segment for today, which is the Singapore Startup Showcase. Four best-in-class startups from Singapore have been selected to pitch to us today. They have been chosen by you, the attendees of GSBF Connect, from a pool of 12 startups via a pre-event poll. Enterprise Singapore has invited leading practitioners of open innovation and venture capital in Germany to provide feedback to our startups. Allow me to quickly present our jury members, Mr. Kurt Vinnen, who is Managing Director of Munich Network, Ms. Laura Schneider, Venture Manager at 27 Pilots, and Ms. Lisa Liu, Investment Associate, Unternehmer Tomb Venture Capital Partners. Without further ado, let me introduce our first Singapore company, V Key, who is represented by co-founder and CEO, Mr. Joseph Gunn. Joseph, please. Good day to all. I am Joseph Gunn, CEO and co-founder of VKey. Our mission in VKey is to secure the global digital experience. While we have rapidly adopted digital technologies on mobile and embedded devices all around us, these are unfortunately still very insecure. The security protections that we have grown so used to in the past 20 to 30 years, in our desktops, in our servers, in our networks, are woefully lacking in our iOS and Android mobile devices today. Governments issue identity cards, banks, ATM and credit cards, telcos embed SIM cards in our phones, and even mobile phone manufacturers have tried to embed some hardware protections into the mobile phones we carry. Unfortunately, when it comes to the software we actually use in our mobile phones, the channel we actually use today, our mobile applications, we cannot actually gain access to this hardware directly. VKey secures the digital experience and creates seamless interactions between people, machines, and organizations. We do this through our patented VOS technology that enables secure digital identities and data to be delivered to end users through digital channels such as mobile apps. For critical transactions such as digital banking, we enable the complete banking experience in a mobile app. From opening a bank account with electronic KYC, to having safe access when logging in with biometrics, to eliminating the hassle of carrying hardware authentication tokens everywhere you go. Top banks all over the world have already made use of our smart token and messaging solution to enable seamless yet secure authentication and transactions in their mobile apps. Beyond banking, any app that contains personal critical information is vulnerable to attack and can be secured by our app protection solution. We secure mobile services such as government and healthcare apps to protect your digital identity and help our partners turn the mobile phone into secure mobile wallets. In the Internet of Things space, VKey has also been working in areas such as smart cities, automotive, telecommunications, and cloud identities to roll out trusted services for embedded solutions. With the world's first virtual secure elements as the core technology of our digital trust platform, we are collaborating with partners to enable digital transformation. We can revolutionize the way you work and live. We can also empower new technology opportunities. The possibilities are endless. I invite you to join us in this journey and look forward to partnering with you to enable our new digital economy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joseph, and welcome to our jury members as well. So we'll go into a very quick uh, lightning round of questions for Joseph, or maybe comments as well. So maybe you could start with Kurt from Munich Network. Kurt. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for the great presentation. I have uh, three questions uh, from the beginning. Uh, VK is talking of its patented VOS uh, virtual secure element as the security foundation of its VOS solutions. What is the core of the patent? Okay, yeah, um, the pattern really combines a virtual kind of cryptographic uh, machine together with temporal protection in and around a virtual machine. Uh, conceptually, it's similar to a hardware smart card, but implemented through a virtual environment. We have actually been granted a patent, not just in Singapore, but in the United States, in China, in Australia, and across the European Union. Thank you very much. Second question. Uh, how does VK realize uh, that its solution was compromised and how long takes it to react? 
Yes, that's a very important question because it's, it's, it's important not just to, to know that you have the protections in place, but to ensure that you have proactive mechanisms to guard against intrusion. So firstly, we've gone through multiple penetration tests. We've been certified both by FIPS 140-2 in uh, North, North America, as well as um, actually uh, common criteria, EL3+, plus in Germany, actually. Um, and we've also gone for multiple penetration tests all over the world. We also have um, proactive detections within our virtual secure element. So we're able to detect intrusions on individual devices and report it to a backend server. Thank you. And my last question is, what are the 2021 and the 2022 milestones uh, in VK's growth strategy? Yeah, so VKey is going to be 10 years old come next year. And we've really moved from a startup to a scale-up company. In fact, open innovation is the next area for us where we are building a digital trusted platform together with ecosystems of partners um, in order to offer trusted digital solutions for multiple verticals and use cases. Uh, increasingly, we want to be a platform for our customers and partners to be able to build trusted digital solutions on top of. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks very much, Kurt. Let's move on to Laura. Laura, maybe a question or a comment for Joseph. Hi, Joseph. Nice to meet you. Very impressive technology of yours. I have a question um, with regards to the whole global pandemic this year. Did you see, um, or where our lives got more and more digital and, and remote, did you see an increase for um, security measures and increased demand? Yeah, so I think definitely we saw uh, customers and partners really struggling to deal with the whole uh, pandemic situation. Uh, of course, in the early days of the pandemic, I think IT and security teams were struggling to figure out their priorities. Uh, and of course, as an enterprise software company, international travel uh, was really difficult. Uh, but of course, we have over 70 partners uh, around the world. Uh, so we were fortunate to have, I guess, boots on the ground in in various countries, uh, not just our own sales teams, partners as well, who were engaging our customers, uh, even amidst the pandemic. Uh, we did actually see an uptick in digital transactions, for sure. Uh, so I think generally it's quite widely known, even in areas like digital banking, digital payments, uh, digital government use cases, the number of transactions, interactions, probably double during the COVID-19 period. And that obviously drove a lot of demand uh, for new business solutions. And I think we pride ourselves on not just being a cybersecurity company, but a company that understands the digital user experience and seeks to help our customers uh, grow that and secure that for their end users. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In your field of business, do you see a very regional um, or regional differences in demands for advanced security measures? Um, from organizations, but also from consumers? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, I think. I think, you know, it's interesting that a lot of our technology is quite well understood, I think, in the US and Europe. I think, especially in Europe, there's a lot of experience with smart cards and advanced security mechanisms. In Asia, it's a bit more mixed. Uh, Southeast Asia, in particular, is very fragmented, obviously, very much in some ways like the European Union probably is. Um, but, you know, I think different countries are at different levels of development. Uh, what we're trying to do in order to meet what our customers are looking for across, I guess, not just different countries, but also different use cases and verticals, is to offer a suite of solutions that really build uh, a, a range of end-to-end -end solutions for very specific use cases and what our customers are trying to achieve when it comes to their digital transformations. So we don't just look at mobile application protection, for example, we look at second factor authentication, we look at biometrics, we look at EKYC, um, and, and that's why we, we really do work a lot with our partners, both technology partners and solution partners, to ensure that these solutions are relevant to our customers and the market. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Let's move on to Lisa. Lisa, a question or a comment for Joseph? Yeah, thanks, Joseph. It really sounds impressive how, how far you've made it so far. I have a question, especially when it comes to cybersecurity topics in Europe and especially Germany are very tough on it. And from, from my experience, it's difficult for them to trust people who are not from Germany. Uh, have you faced this? Have you seen this? And what are your plans to build this trust? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. I think that's one of the reasons why we decided to get our common criteria certification uh, from the German uh, certification body, in fact. 
Um, and that's actually at EL3+, Plus, which uh, uh, is uh, the highest actually in the world for a software security solution on both iOS and Android, actually. Uh, so we spent a lot of effort on that and we certified that against actually a US government protection profile under FIPS 140-2. Uh, so I think in, you know, over the past nine, 10 years of our history, it's been very important for us to make sure that our solutions are not just, you know, architecturally sound, which of course is important as well. Um, you know, we don't think it's, it's right to just do a checklist of stuff just to get it out of the way. We really do want our solutions to be very secure. But at the same time, you're absolutely correct. It's also important for us to prove to our customers and our partners that you know, our solution is both practically robust as well as um, you know, certifiably robust in, in a manner that can be trusted as well. And of course, we've done multiple penetration tests uh, internally with a lot of our customers. You know, both banks and governments and payment wallets have done penetration tests lasting from weeks to, in some cases, months. Um, and in many cases, selected us because we would only vendor left standing after those weeks or months. Um, so I think we do have a lot of trust in our technology and we are, uh, I think, well positioned to ex be able to explain to our customers why they should be able to trust our technology. Okay. So do you already have many customers in Germany that would you have run these tests with? Yeah, actually, we are talking to a number of players um, in the automotive sector in particular, um, as well as in the IoT sector. Um, but... To be, to be absolutely frank, in the past few years, we've mostly focused on Asia. I think a few years ago, we looked around the map and it's like, you know, we could, prob you know, we could probably conserve our resources and start with Asia. But we are actually, to be frank, I was planning a trip to Germany in March and then COVID-19 hit. Uh, so, well, this is the second best thing for us. Uh, but we are in a stage where we are scaling beyond Asia um, to, to be frank, uh, Europe in particular. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thanks, Joseph. And to our audience members, if you have interest to find out more about VKey, uh, there is a poll at the bottom of your screen. We invite you to scroll down and uh, indicate your response. So thanks again, Joseph. Uh, let's move on to our next startup. Um, next up is Ms. Eleanor Jin, who is Marketing Manager at Tiger. Eleanor, over to you. Hi, my name is Elena, and I'm part of an amazing AI company called Tiger. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, let me ask first, how long does it take to register a new SME client with a bank traditionally? Uh, well, uh, I'm, let me answer directly. It involves like 12 different types of complex documents uh, through three departments and a total of three days in the best scenario cases. And as we all know, the best case scenario is rarely fulfilled. And there we open up a common problem of the large majority of companies. The inefficient operational cost to manage and process information due a limited capability of automation to process information. But here we come, that's why we exist. Uh, the limited capability of automation to process information could be solved with a technology that could offer more than robotic process and more than easy AI and machine learning. What they need is a technology able to understand the meaning of all the information type, no matter the type of document or its structure. And we can solve this need with symbolic AI, which, uh, which more than five AI disciplines based on natural language processing is used to train the computers to understand information with human logic. Yes, and you read right, contractually guaranteed KPIs to minimize your risk. While other sources of NLP can read this, Tiger can read this type of wild documents and wild information, which represents more than 80% of companies' information. And if you can process the information, you can scale and connect to one common ecosystem uh, your, inf your information to all your users. So we have the best solution that fits a self-serve platform for multiple industries with advanced AI components to understand the key data and help your business grow. Um, then, uh, so going back to the question we asked at the beginning, how long do you think we have improved the SME digital onboarding process for one of our clients? And the answer is uh, three days to just 15 minutes. This is 
one of our best cases and that's why we are taking this as an example. In fact, this solution won the Innovation Award by EFMA and Accenture last year, as well as these other awards and recognitions during all these years. Being the first Austrian Spanish company that provides AI technology uh, to the Singapore's government. And this is uh, another uh, another award that uh, for this year, Tiger is named in the Ghana's Hip Psych for 2020. Really honored to be part of this report. While LPS market uh, 1.3 billion is expected, our market uh, worth more than 77 billion of dollars. So nowadays we are involved in more than 50 global projects in three industries mainly, the public sector, banking, financials, and insurance, with an easy business model that is flexible for technology deployment and an annual recurrent revenue from subscription and technology use. And that's why all these companies are trusting us. So thank you very much and for more information, tigers.com. And here's my email for any doubt or any uh, query that you want. I, um, you can find me here. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Elena. Uh, let's move on to the question and answer segment. Kurt, let's start with you again. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, fantastic presentation, Elena. Uh, my question, uh, two questions from, from my side is, uh, what is the core of the TIGER extraction tool? Okay, the technology core, you yeah. mean, right? Yeah. Okay, so our technology, it mainly based on natural language processing. We have like NLP engineers, a whole team of NLP en engineers that, uh, that knows uh, uh, several languages, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, uh, English, and so on. So, and five of uh, the semantic technology that we have and we use with the, another AI disciplines like machine learning, also uh, computer vision and so on. Uh, we, have, we have it patented uh, in US uh, like uh, years ago. So based on NLP, we mix it with another disciplines in, uh, from, uh, from the AI technologies and we get our accuracy uh, to ext extract the information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, NLP is, yeah, it, it's uh, 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 often seen technology right now. Uh, what makes your extraction tool different to these others? Okay. Uh, I, I really like this question because uh, as anything in life, the, the, the key point here is the mixed. We mix NLP with another AI disciplines. The formula, it's quite, we, we say it like a Coca-Cola formula, it's quite secret, but okay, it's not so secret. So the mix makes uh, our success and our accuracy to be achieved. And also, of course, our amazing team of NLP engineers who make the ontologies work. And and yeah, that's that's the key point of our core. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Laura, let's move over to you. Thank you. Hi, Elena. Great presentation. Thank you. We see a lot of uh, demand for a solution like yours with our corporate clients. So I think it's a really, really um, relevant and important topic right now. One question and one challenge that always come with machine learning based solutions is the challenge of training those solutions, right? How do you deal with that challenge and um, how do you enable clients to, to onboard quickly and to get the algorithms trained for their needs in a fast period of time? 
Yeah, uh, that's a really, really good question, Laura. Thank you. Uh, a lot of um, technology that we know that it's based on machine learning, they are they use or well, the technology used to train the computer, the software, uh, is based on a non-symbolic AI. Of okay, they they take a huge amount of data information and they train the they teach the computer and the software uh, slowly by all all the data that they consume. But if we use symbolic AI, this is uh, the, the technology that here in Tiger we use, uh, we train, uh, our technology works with, uh, with 200 documents. And what we teach them first is the sem a semantic logic uh, before uh, to process all the data, and if when when you have uh, the um, the ontology clear and you know the domain the, the domain clear, uh, the the software can be trained easily with an NLP and so on. So this is the the difference. For example, Google if uh, the uh, the, the um, Engine, search engine tool, he, they use like uh, the non-symbolic base. It's, they, they consume a lot of data to train their machine learning, uh, to train their machine. And well, the machine learning is based on yes, the amount of data, yes, but yes. ours, it's uh, symbolic. Yes, we use language and linguistic logic. Interesting. One other question from my side. So you can process a high amount of different document types, right? Is there one specific field or business area in organizations where you see the highest impact of your solution? So highest cost and, and time savings? Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, and as you know, nowadays a lot of companies, well, the large ones, uh, they are processing a lot of information. And now we, in one day, uh, in 2020, uh, we can produce as much as data, uh, you know, in a whole year in 19, you know, 1994. So, the the data processing, it's it's really really important. Important. And our our experience, for example, we start uh, in 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 banking sectors, for example, for legal documentation, because there are a lot of uh, uh, tech, you know, tech, uh, technical uh, language that uh, legal experts know, but another department do, doesn't. So we make the you know the bridge between departments and making easy to understand this type of documentation while automating all these. Task. And also, uh, we had the uh, amazing opportunity to work with Singapore government. And well, you know, as a government in a, a public sector, the the citizen is the final uh, target. So, uh, a lot of you know, for example, simple queries that can be solved with our technology. Uh, for example, uh, for the in-house uh, department or the lawyers and you know the notaries and so on. So yeah, I think uh, uh, in our case, we have a lot of experience in banking, legal, but I'm sure that there's another uh, areas that we can help in a lot. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Laura. Um, Lisa, we're running a little bit short of time, but I was hoping you could have maybe a, a quick question or a quick comment for Elena. We have about a minute. Yes, I do have a quick question. So it, it sounds like your technology is really great. And um, I believe that maybe you're better than maybe existing solutions out there. But I think in this market, it's also really important to have a good execution and go to market strategy. So how can you compete against like very strong competitors in the market that are existing now? Yeah, this is a, a hard question, Lisa. <laughs> and nowadays, uh, uh, for example, uh, to work with uh, Sing the Singapore government uh, give us uh, a huge advantage because, for example, you know that here in well, there in Singapore they have IMDA, uh, an organization who trust and who you know who test our technology before we start uh, working with them. So this is a huge opportunity that we take a, a years before. And, um, and um, uh, in most cases, when you is, okay, you sell your technology to big companies, they usually test your uh, technology first against 
uh, another ones. So uh, a lot of times, for example, for the uh, FinTech uh, City uh, FinTech Challenge uh, years ago, uh, we were like competing against uh, two other providers and and in you know in a real environment we can prove that our accuracy uh, works and that's why we contractually guaranteed first because we know that our technology works and and yet yeah, this is by well by by demonstrating that our technology wor works this is the only way so Thank you. Thanks very much, Elena. And again, to our audience members, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about Tiger, do respond to our poll at the bottom of your screens. Uh, let us proceed now to Mr. Ting Yen, who is Head of Finance at Evercom. Ting Yen, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ting from Evercom Singapore. Today, I'm going to talk about Evercom's approach to expedite sustainability implementation across the world. 16.5 trillion by 2030 is estimated to be the global opportunity to manage decarbonization. And the secret behind this high number is a variety of skills and knowledge are required to manage decarbonization. Because when we look at Asia, Asia alone has more than 800 million sites, equivalent to more than 5.6 billion equipment running daily and consuming energy. As a result, how to make decarbonization knowledge easily implementable and scalable is the thing we're looking after. So our solution is we're trying to pay decarbonization forward with data. We have so many different kinds of equipment across different sites. So what we try to do is we are connecting these equipment through equipment data on our decarbonization platform. So on our platform, we offer mainly two services. One is the data subscription services to help you collect your uh, data more efficiently. And also we have a series of AI digital services to help you manage your sustainability in a cost-effective and scalable way based on your individual requirement. As a result, this results in more than 90% of the cost reduction and around 40% of the operational efficiency improvement through managing decarbonization on our decarbonization platform. For example, uh, when we have real-time equipment data on hand, our equipment AI will quickly classify and identify the anomalies on the signatures and highlight it on our uh, UI for visualization. So by reviewing these anomalies, we can quickly understand this current situation of equipment operations and our equipment AI will give a recommendation to help you mitigate the anomalies and the operational inefficiencies. However, when it comes to large-scale decarbonization, it's not something we can achieve in one day or achieve uh, through, only through ourselves. As a result, for the past few years, we have partnered with MNCs or industry leaders or in, uh, governments, international organizations to make a large-scale decarbonization even more possible. So uh, on our decarbonization platform, currently we have covered chiller, pump, and solar inverter with generators, furnaces, and boilers coming soon. So for the past seven years, after going through a series of vertical integration, we have established 10 plus public-private partnership across four countries and with 200 plus digitalization deployment pilots in progress. So through all these partnerships, uh, we're trying to make decarbonization readily available and scalable for everyone. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, Ting Yen. Uh, let's move on to the question uh, and answer segment. Just to mix it up a bit, let's start with Lisa. Yeah, sure. Hi, thanks a lot for your presentation. So I have two questions. The first one for you is, um, so you said that you're integrating into the factories and the machines. But many times this data is proprietary. How do you access that data from your clients? Um, hi, okay. Um, so basically there are two ways for us to collect the data. One is um, if the existing site, no matter if it's a factories or commercial buildings, just like we're just looking uh, uh, at the equipment across these different sites. Um, if you have existing data infrastructure, for example, like building management system or MES, all these, we can do an integrations, um, like to, to do like a system integration for us to pull the data and put it in our equipment AI for us to, to give you the recommendation 
to use our services. This is one way. And but some of the sites, especially in like emerging markets, that um, these kind of digitalization or data is not that available. Uh, we have our own IoT capability, which is our IoT sensors. So we can just use IoT sensors to like, collect data for you and to 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 just simply use our solution. So basically, these are the two ways for us to, to collect the data. And basically, what we do is we just collect the equipment data. So basically, just the parameters like um, temperatures, power consumption, all these. So most of uh, the time, is is this kind of OK. Yeah. OK, cool. And my, my second question is, so yeah, I understand that you're digitalizing it and collecting all the data. But where does the decarbonization come into play? Um, so what we do is when it comes to decarbonization, um, it's not just like most of people will always think about energy efficiency. But for us is we always look at the performance of the equipment because if the equipment is performing well, decarbonization is, or, or like energy efficiency, all these is just a byproduct. So what we do is uh, previously the issue is for some of the site manager or some of the like the sites they need to hire like a dedicated engineering team to manage all these equipment to make sure they're operating efficiently but of course these kind of experts are very hard to find and not to mention like knowledge is very hard to to foster so as a result is by using our services which is the ai services through equipment data is our ai will give you the um like give you the operational insights which is the recommendations so for us, it's will quantify the impact for you. For example, now we have an anomaly. What does this mean? It means like your pump is not operating well or the chiller or the going tower and how to rectify and how to, um, how to optimize the current situation. Um, so basically it's all recommended by our equipment AI. So by um, optimizing the equipment performance, then decarbonization is just a byproduct. Okay, but then you could also technically say, suggest to the clients, hey, this machine that you're using is consuming more uh, energy than it should be um, if, because we have benchmarks. So why don't you replace this machine? Is this something uh, that you're also covering? Correct, yeah, this is a very good point. So actually that's why, uh, why we call it the carbonization platform because on, uh, on one hand is we're managing demand side, which is uh, the energy usage. So we help you to manage, uh, optimize your energy efficiency, like your decarbonization mandate. And on the other hand is we also help you, we're trying to see um, decarbonization is not only a matter of cost saving, but also a matter of like how to optimize your entire uh, capex and how to even make a profit. So for example, changing equipment is one thing. So we will connect equipment vendors. If some of the brown technology needs replacement, of course the equipment vendors will tap in and replace into more green and more efficient technologies. And also uh, for this year, we're also uh, using equipment data to spin off some profit opportunities. For example, carbon offset services or automating uh, carbon uh, avoidance certificates, all these to make decarbonization not really only a cost saving issue, but also like a profit making, a profit -making initiative. Yep. Thank you, Ting Yen, and thanks, Lisa, for those questions. Let's move on quickly to Kurt. Kurt, a question or a comment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jan, for your uh, great presentation. Uh, what I've uh, learned is uh, that uh, Evercom provides uh, IoT AI driven asset performance management solutions uh, to different segments. Uh, what I'm keen on uh, to get a, a concrete example uh, where your, your asset management uh, or performance management uh, uh, and how it is working. Second is, uh, what are your customers in the different uh, client segments? Uh, uh, and the, the third one is, uh, my main question is, how do you earn money? Uh, what's your business model? Um, okay, so let's start from question number one is, uh, maybe I'll give you a brief case study of how we're doing it in Singapore. So in Singapore, um, our biggest, uh, we have a customer, for example, like a hotel, because when it comes to a ho um, hotel, hotel is actually in the building sector consumes the most energy. So hotel, um, the, like the issue for them is, um, in COVID situation, this hotel's revenue stream has seriously been impacted. And um, because of that, then they are also thinking it's like, in a way they can manage revenue, how they can manage in operating cost perspective. So that's why they're looking for our solution. And for us is through our solution, there are two ways they can benefit from. 
Uh, one is, of course, um, we can help them optimize their operational efficiency uh, in an energy, uh, in an equipment performance perspective through like uh, equipment data to optimize their performance. And most importantly is now it's because of our like uh, all these kind of solutions. So they don't really need to go on site manually and collect all the data. Like they don't need to go to the chill plan and open the door and actually noting down the data and process the data and come up with the results. So they can optimize their human resource. And at the same time, in a way, these kind of operational efficiency will help them to optimize their OPEX, especially under- Understood, I understood because uh, time, we're running out of time and uh, Laura maybe has a question too. Uh, one sentence to your, your business model, please. Um, so for our business model is simply, uh, we're offering in the entire thing in a, a monthly subscription. So okay. you're subscribing like a hundred uh, a dollar, like sing dollar per equipment per month. We simply just count how many equipment and we just integrate everything, including IOT sensors, including AI and all these. So it's just a monthly subscription. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Laura, over to you. Just a quick question. Thank you, Ting. So first of all, um, we see a high shift in organizations across industries to sustainability. So I think you're operating in a really, really interesting market here. Um, one quick question, maybe from my side, what's your vision for Evercom for the next five years? Um, so for us is uh, like I just briefly uh, discussed before is we want to make decarbonization not a only a cost saving initiative, but more like a but even spinning up profit opportunities. How does this work is, for example, take hotel as an example. Since we have all the equipment data, now is we're using equipment data to even starting to quantify each room, the carbon footprint of each room. So when hotel guests check out, now is with equipment data, we're providing them an option for them to offset their carbon footprint, for them to go net zero. And this contribution for hotel will directly go into the hotel screen fund and support the hotel screen initiative. This is one way. And also, of course, because of all the carbon trading, carbon act, uh, we will use the equipment data to automate the carbon avoidance certifi certificate and for them to trade. So this is another uh, revenue opportunity or profit opportunity spinning off through equipment data. So these are uh, this is our vision uh, for the decarbonization platform. Yeah. Thank you, Ting. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thanks, Ting. Um, let's move on to our last startup uh, who is represented by founder, uh, Ms. Didi Gan of uh, Vkang. Didi, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Didi. Um, I am from Enemy Relations and I would like to start to present to you our brand, Okay, The viral resistance designed for you and your loved ones. Our company works very closely with various research labs and we have spent years on antimicrobial technology to engineer a high performing um, protective solution to help to fight the ever increasing threat from pathogens the K99 is a long-term self-disinfecting compound to prevent transmitting and mitigate drug resistance. It provides a non-toxic alternative from chemical disinfectants. This patented technology is a sustainable plant synthesis microparticles that has demonstrated a powerful, consistent, long-lasting efficacy through the generation of reactive oxygen species which uh, mimic, uh, which is called ROS. Active ingredients in the market, such as titanium oxide, zinc oxide, are able to also mimic ROS by photocatalysis when light is needed, but light is needed. Um, the uniqueness is that the k is effective in all conditions, even in complete darkness. It has proven to have also high potencies of antibacterial properties, achieving an eight lot reduction, um, which, which means 99% of the bacteria are killed. It also destroys superbugs such as MRSA and BRE, which are major, major hospital-based and communal infections. So it's a powerful uh, technology as it not only destroys pathogens, it also um, degrades for metahides and VOCs. It also prevents molding, fouling, and bioform formations. Research has shown that SARS-CoV-2 can persist up to two days on surgical grounds. So we decided to also test weekend night night um, efficacy on textile surfaces in various third-party labs, and it has proven to inactivate 99% of uh, viruses 
such as influenzas, H3N2. We even tested it on the SARS-CoV-2 strain that caused COVID-19, and it shows 99% reduction. There was a shortage of medical grade masks when the pandemic broke out early this year. So we decided to work on reusable self-sanitizing masks using the Vikang 99 technology uh, as the first use case. So we, we successfully developed VMAS. Um, he has actually even gotten, it's, a, it's an antiviral nanotech uh, mask and it could be reusable up to 30 washes. And we have um, even gotten the CT mapping as a medical device under the EN1463 Type 2R surgical mask category. So uh, on the whole, Vikang Nana is a safer and cost-effective alternative that could be ha that has many other potential uh, applications as well. It could be used for textiles coated onto uniforms. It could be used in hospitals. It could be uh, used onto wipes and or uh, even coated onto um, surfaces for um, long-lasting disinfectant. It could also, also be used in air purifications, which remove odors and reuses in the environment. Thank you for your time. Looking forward to share more about the technology with you guys. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Thanks very much, Didi. Let's move on quickly. Um, let's start first with, uh, with Lisa. And uh, I also do remind our jury and uh, Didi to please keep your responses um, brief. Lisa, please. Yeah, thanks, Didi. That sounds really cool. And I think it's the perfect time um, for your kind of technology. Um, I'm wondering how is it effective for like 99.9%, .9%, but how does this compare to existing antiviral and antibacterial solutions? So the, the, the plus point of it is it's a plant-based technology, and we actually even tested it with, um, we have synthesized it with and without the plant-based and we realized that with the plant-based technology synthesis, it actually has higher efficacy. So we can get a full lot reduction within five minutes, which is um, comparable or even better than a lot of technologies out there. However, the plus point is that we're using reusable uh, uh, waste from plants for the synthesis, oh. yeah. Okay. Uh, Lisa, uh -huh. thank you. Let's move on to Kurt. Kurt, a question or a comment? Uh, I have to execute me because uh, uh, in this field of uh, medicine and chemistry and biotech, I'm not very familiar with, and I'm very shy to, to ask a really thoughtful question. I, I'm astonished and, and like your presentation uh, very much, but uh, sorry for that, I'm, I'm, I do not have a, any thoughtful question for my side because it's not a home run for me, this field you are acting in. No worries. No worries, Kurt. Thanks very much for that. Let's move on to Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Didi, for, for your presentation. As Lisa already said, I think um, your kind of solutions have moved a lot more into the focus this year, right? Yes. So one, um, yeah, one shift that we see with all our corporate clients is um, that everyone now starts to think about um, coating also consumer products and um, making them hygienically safe. I mean, you stressed um, hospitals, for example, and, and airplanes as, as um, major use cases. But could you imagine um, having those kind of coatings on consumer products, on products that we actually use every day? Yeah, so actually um, the first use case that we have for the technology is on face masks, definitely, because Due, the, due to the COVID situation. And then now we have in our labs actually prototypes for long-term um, disinfecting coating. So it can last up to three months. So we are in the prototype phase now and we are having a partner that are executing it in their cleaning business to see how far it can um, do in the field test. Mm -hmm. So you would, you're currently thinking about having this coating on, I don't know. It can device. be, we, uh, we are kind of um, preparing a coating that could be used for all surfaces. So mm -hmm. tables, chairs, um, uh, textiles. So it will be a, a one-time coating that could last for uh, two to, uh, for, there'll be a different variations. The, the first one would be two weeks. The second type would be for three months. And we want to do one that could last 
up to six months. Interesting. One maybe additional question from my side, from your experience, from your knowledge in this kind of field, do you think that um, the global pandemic this year will change the consumer's um, view on, 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 on hygiene forever? Or is this rather a temporary trend? I think it will be a long-term um, problem that we have. So antimicrobial coating, it's Hi, Didi. I think we might have lost you for a minute. I wonder if you could try speaking again. Okay. Okay, I think Didi obviously has run into some technical issues. Let's just give her a little bit more time to maybe log in again. Didi, I'm not sure if you can hear this, but uh, we, we can't hear you. Your screen has frozen. Um, if you can hear this, perhaps you could switch off your video. And let's just try your audio. I think, ladies and gentlemen, just in view of the time, perhaps you could just draw this session to a close. Um, you know, if any of us have questions that we had wanted to raise with Didi, I encourage you to get in touch with her. Um, so let's, uh, you know, conclude this session. Thank you very, very much to all our startups and to our jury members as well, Kurt, Laura, and Lisa. Really appreciate your presence here. So ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the Singapore Startup Showcase and today's event. Recordings actually of all 12 of our startup uh, pitches are available in the GSBF Connect digital building, which is at the Switch platform. So on behalf of the organizers, Enterprise Singapore and the Asia Pacific Community of German Business, I'd like to thank all of you for spending your uh, afternoon or morning with us. And let me also um, express appreciation to all of our supporting partners, 27 Pilots, Digital Hub Logistics Hamburg, German Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship Asia, Munich Network, and Unternehmer to Venture Capital Partners. And to all our participants, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Please do drop us an email at gspfconnect at enterprisesg.gov.sg if you wish to follow up on any of the discussions today. So thank you again, and we hope to see you at the next GSPF Connect.